welcome to the museum. Um, a little bit about Sandy Spring Museum for those who don't know or not familiar. So Sandy Spring Museum is a community-driven arts and education center. Um, if you're not familiar with the museum or, you know, as a little refresher or maybe um, new information for you, um, the Sandy Spring Museum is actually shifting from a historical museum to a focus on cultural heritage of past and present. There will be more coming out about that in 2023, so please stay tuned. Um, no matter what we're doing here at Sandy Spring Museum, community is always at the center of all of our programs. So we're very much focused on the people here in Sandy Spring, the people of Olney, the people of Montgomery County and beyond. It's, it's very much um, at the center of all that we do. Um, and it's actually very relevant to uh, having our speaker here today. We actually, um, as a part of our community-centered approach, uh, we allow suggestions and take suggestions from the community for programs. And so a member of the community actually reached out to the museum and said, you have to invite this speaker here. You have to have her here. So we contacted Eve. I thought it was a long shot since she's originally from Vermont. Um, but she is so, we're, we're very lucky to have you here. Um, so before I shift things over to Eve, I'm going to give her a brief introduction. Um, it's very brief. She's done so many things, and I'm sure she'll tell you more about them. But here we go. So Eve Jacobs Carnahan is a visual artist who works with knitting. She is the creator of Knit Democracy Together Project, a collaborative art project holding knitting circles with civically minded crafters to demystify the electoral process and stimulate action. Amazing. Um, National Arts Strategies named Eve a Creative Community Fellow in 2021. Eve knit away stress while earning a bachelor's in history with honors from Swarthmore College and a JD from the University of Chicago. She lives in Vermont. So welcome, Eve, for today's program. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie, and thank you all for having me here. Um, so I am going to talk to you this evening about art, knitting, and calls to action. I'm going to show you um, knitting that is not hats and mittens, but <laughs> rather knitting that is artwork displayed in galleries, knitting that is performance art, and some social action projects. First, I want to tell you a little story. So, I come to this subject um, as an artist and activist myself. I make knitted artwork, um, which many people say, like, what the heck is knitted artwork? And in fact, um, when I tell people that's what I make, they give me this blank look. I even have this photographer friend who, whenever I would see him on the street and we'd talk about art, he would always ask me about my weaving. Well, <laughs> it turns out that his this mental slip actually reveals a historical truth because early textile art was weaving in the 1960s. This type of work, this was a big important exhibit in 1963 in New York City. This was the type of, of textile work that women were doing to say the type of work that we do can be just as powerful um, as ceramic or stone or big sculpture. And we're going to make weavings with rope, and we're going to use muscle to create these, and we're going to do these big things. So that's a piece of historical background. But then the first person to, um, to create any knitted artwork is Mary Walker Phillips. And she's working on a piece there, plus you see one behind her. Um, she started at learning weaving <laughs> at the Cranbrook Academy in Michigan. Her work was abstract, um, imitating and taking inspiration from metal, metal tracery, metal sculpture, stone um, designs like that. Once we get to the 1970s, though, um, women artists started using knitting and crochet to um, push the boundaries in scale um, and in material. This crocheted room was part of a feminist art project at California Institute of the Arts in 1972 known as Woman House, which you may have heard of. And um, it, this, the, the ideas of um, connecting the textile arts with feminism 
will show up often throughout the work that I'm going to show you today. So another important um, influence that I'm sure you're all familiar with are the AIDS project, the NAMES project quilts. And so unlike the bold weaving that was shown in the 1960s that was about um, pushing to sort of be um, strong and take textile things and try to imitate male things and make them strong. This was about, this was using the comforting nature of what textile arts are, a comforting quilt, a comforting blanket as part of the message of what was being um, communicated. But the other th thing about this, of course, is that it was accessible to every, anybody. Anybody could make these um, quilts to honor people who had died from AIDS. And it, it was so, in that way, it was community participatory, um, and, but brought everybody together to make these really important statements. So, one of, the, um, one of the early art knitters of the 1990s is Catherine Kobe. And when I first saw her artwork, that was the first time I realized that anybody used knitting for anything other than hats and sweaters. And since I live in Vermont and she lived in Maine, I wasn't all that far away and I went to her studio and said, you know, I want to learn more from you. This is one of her um, big pieces kind of six feet tall pieces um, around, uh, with an anti-war theme. Um, it's made of black plastic bags, which are a petroleum product, and it has to do with the Gulf War, and it has to do with concern about oil spills um, affecting birds, but of course it also has to do with war and oil affecting all of us. She, um, she said that if you're going to say something, if you're gonna make something with knitting, make it large, say it large. <laughs> and she definitely did that. Um, this is a, a special kind of installation view of a piece that she did um, called Ritual Against Homelessness. And these um, figures are, are made, again, they're taller than I am. Um, she hand spun the yarn for these figures and she didn't use dyed yarn, she used natural yarn. And of course she made them to look like they were the ragged coverings that somebody would be wearing on the street to just help keep themselves worn. They're not pure white or um, clean dyed brown. They're showing the earthiness and the, the grime of the world around them. Um, I just think this is a really moving piece. So this is a performance piece. This is just the craziest thing. So this artist, Janet Morton, in Toronto, sat in a storefront window for a month. She sat there from um, 10 to 5, six days a week, knitting the news. <laughs> This is called News Flash. So here, and, and you might see on the wall behind her purposely, she put these pictures of people knitting. I'm not exactly sure what's in all of the pictures, but she is using gigantic knitting needles. And she is, was knitting headlines from the news that were happening during the 30 days that she was there. And it's, of course, it's ironic that it's News Flash because this is going very slowly. <laughs> Um, this is the completed piece, but you can get a sense of how big it is because you saw it on her lap when only a small amount was there. So um, she's trying to get people to slow down. It's an, it's a, and this is 1995, and just think today, of course, when we think of fast-paced news, but it was a response to the fast pace of the world and of news and how we forget what's in the news. And so... Now, when she did this in 1995, she was probably thinking about newspapers that get thrown out. Um, today, we're thinking of what we scroll past. But if you've made this into a blanket, it's more preserved. Um, the subtitle of the piece is called Madame Defarge um, 
eat your heart out. Um, <laughs> and so if you don't remember, Madame Defarge in The Tale of Two Cities sat next to the guillotine and knitted the names of the um, people who were killed on the guillotine. Um, it's just amazing. Um, she did another per, um, piece um, in Toronto called Cozy. So this was um, a house that she created from uh, sweaters that she repurposed that she found at thrift stores and sewed them together. And in this setting, um, it looks kind of cozy and like a cute little cottagey kind of kind of place. One of the things that she did both in the storefront and in this piece is take the idea of knitting as a private thing and bring it into the public sphere. And that um, is something that a lot of artists have done with textile arts in general and with knitting to, for many reasons, like partly to bring the caring aspects of knitting and making comforting clothes into the public and to maybe to heal the public, but also maybe to question things. Um, so she displayed this twice. She displayed it here in this um, woodsy area in the exact same piece in a public park in Toronto. And so when you look at it here, it means a totally different thing. And you might start to think about, well, who would want to live in it here? You know, maybe this is now not a cozy getaway cottage. It's a shelter for people who don't have a shelter. And it's here, it's overpowered by that great big building. But it's the same house. So the next, um, so both the, uh, those artists I showed you at first pretty much engaged people by having people come and view their work. This is a piece that engaged people by having them participate. So um, Kat Maza organized the Nike blanket petition as a literal petition to send to or present to Nike in the early 2000s to protest the um, sweatshop labor conditions of their workers. And so it is 15 feet long and five and a half feet tall. And you see those white tags hanging off of it? Those tags each have the name of the person who either knit or crocheted those squares. Here's a close up picture of some of it. And so each of these four inch by four inch squares was made by a different person and they signed it in essence with that tag as part of their signing the petition. Um, she um, she uh, has done, it, 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 she also wanted to emphasize the contrast between sweatshop labor conditions and the um, handcraft comfortable positions of the people who were making these things for the, for the petition. Another um, artist who engaged the community um, is Lindsay Obermeyer with the Red Thread Project. So instead of this being a project where she was protesting and sending something to other people, this is very much about community involvement. She called this the Red Thread Project because she um, drew on a Chinese proverb that reads, an invisible red thread connects those who are destined to meet regardless of time, place, or circumstance. The thread may stretch or tangle, but it will never break. So each of the hats attached to this long thread was made by someone in the community, and then she brought them all together um, and attached them to this, this I think it was a third of a mile long um, knitted cord and how the people put them on and she called it a dance. I was actually there at that. It wasn't really, you just shuffled a little back and forth. But, <laughs> but then you were, so you were there in community with these people. Then you, also she then detached them and gave them to cancer patients at people in shelters, um, distributed them throughout the community. So she's literally taking that caring of the making and distributing them to people. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, the whole idea of making groups making things and distributing them because people here have already told me that some of you are working on things for that very purpose. 
Um, but having this aspect of the physical coming together is really a cool thing. So Liz Collins um, did another type of performance art involving a lot of people. So this um, was a performance that she did as part of a broader event on Governor's Island in New York that was organized as a call to arms for art. And it was sort of loosely based on the idea of a Civil War reenactment, um, but the reason for gathering was for art purposes. And um, this is the first, she continued making projects like this for about a dozen years, but this was the first one, and it was called The Muster, I think because of the, the theme of the call to arms for art. Um, she created, so you, you can see the people sitting there, you can get an idea of how large this beginning of a flag is going to be. Um, those people were sitting under those tents, and the tents are kind of knitted, they're using knitting machines, they are wearing um, uniforms that are part of the Knitting Nation um, team, knitter, <laughs> knitters, and she's did this um, whole project as a commentary on how humans react, how humans interact with machines and with global manufacturing, raising questions about trade and labor. Um, she's got the sort of commentaries about brands, you know, there, this is the Knitting Nation brand of making this and the iconography that goes with it on the backs of their shirts. And she really was raising questions about the fashion industry and textile fabrication in general and getting people to sort of think about how, what the processes are. Um, here is another one of the projects that she did. This was three years later. It, this one was in Providence, Rhode Island, and uh, they made the pride flag with this one. Um, each time she did one of these projects, it, it was site-specific, having some connection to that place, as well as um, physically stretching out in, in, in the space, in a way. And I hope you can see that these colors, they come from the tent, from the knitting machines in the tent, and that as they're coming out, they're being sewn together. This is like a massive thing to make. So, as these projects were happening, um, then you start getting people sort of watching and commenting on, well, what is this phenomenon of all of these textile projects and things happening, and you get these ideas of craftivism, which you may have heard about. So, um, I, there was a woman named Sabrina Geschwantner who put together a zine, which is um, sort of like a handmade magazine and hand distributed, um, that was that did commentaries on craft, the politics of craft, and in one of the issues of this zine. Um, an artist named Lisa Ann Auerbach wrote what she called a knitting manifesto. And here's a little piece of it, but before I read you a piece of it, I, I want to, um, well, actually, uh, part of what she's talking about here is she's talking about charting your message, and all of her knitted artwork has words on it. Charting your message and wear it proudly, resist fashion, manufacture your own brand, embrace tradition, Learn from history, shatter the present, create the future. Stitch by stitch, we can and will change the world. The revolution is at hand, and knitting needles are the only weapons you'll need. Stop making scarves, start making trouble. <laughs> and it was actually a pretty long manifesto. That doesn't even have all of it. But what she ended with was, was this message, consume less, create more. Knitting is political, begin immediately. And this picks up on other themes that other... Um, culture historians have talked about, which is that this knitting has been a political tool for feminists, and it has been a, a message of anti-capitalism because of the handmade nature and the slow nature of making things. And it has been picked up by a lot of people as a means of demonstrating the power and discontent of ordinary individuals, ordinary people. 
So one of the things that Lisa Ann Auerbach did was she made these body count mittens as an anti-war statement, and she distributed the pattern. But the pattern would change based on when you were making it, because what she did was she would, like in this one, she started the mitten on January 30th, 2007, and at that point, 3,084 American soldiers had died in um, the Iraq war, and then she put an updated number of 3,121, February 10th, when she finished the mitten. And part of her idea was that if you were following her pattern and making this, and you were at the waiting room for an appointment, or you were on the train or something, and somebody said, oh, what are you knitting? Well, <laughs> that opens a conversation that you might not have had otherwise. Um, so a very um, interesting tool. I wanted, though, to contrast this with the, um, the craftivist um, manifesto that a British a, a woman activist named Sarah Corbett created. It's not as much of a bold push um, message. Her approach around the same time period and, and continuing today is to have um, a quieter message that is well targeted and um, persuasive. And her principles are to be the tortoise, craft is our tool, use solidarity, not sympathy, find comfort in contemplation, the thinking, the process of making the piece is part of the contemplation. Um, embrace small is beautiful. She often um, works on things that have to do with small messages, small pieces. Provoke, don't preach, and embrace positivity. So one example of one of her efforts was this craftivist protest that she organized outside of a department store in London to um, protest the wages that the people working in the department store were getting. And so here they are with their British picnic, and each of the people sitting there is embroidering um, a small handkerchief with a message that would then be presented to the, um, the owners of the department store with the message of, you need to be changing what you're doing. She's organized um, projects that are very targeted to boards of directors or um, particular decision makers in city government and sends them these quiet messages as an attempt to just zero in and target in a gentle way to sneak in there. And both approaches have validity. It's just, I wanted to point out these two different, different approaches to using um, textiles in craftivism. So I'm going to continue with some other examples of different kinds of, um, of projects. Um, so this is the Crochet Coral Reef. I'm wondering if anybody here actually participated in this. No, OK. So um, these two sisters, Margaret and Christine Wertheim, at the Institute for Figuring, um, one is an artist and one is, I think, a mathematician. And they grew up. Um, in Australia, and we're very familiar with the, the Great Barrier Reef, and they're very concerned about the pollution and the climate change that are making the reef um, die off. And they came up with this idea of like, oh, let's crochet a coral reef and we'll raise awareness for what's happening. So people around the world, literally around the world, <laughs> were inspired, they, they got the word out, and they, and people would make a piece of coral. And these were gathered together in gigantic displays. And there have been many iterations of the crocheted coral reef. Uh, this one is made all of plastic to emphasize the role of plastic. Um, and th these have been displayed in places just filling huge museum galleries. This one um, is the showing the, the dead, the de reef, the bleached dead coral, and on that board, chalkboard behind it has a lot of the mathematics and um, science that they also want to teach people. So part of their whole project was to 
help people learn about what was going on with the science and um, biology of the reef. Here's one more um, of Liz Collins' Knitting Nation projects that it shows just a different way of her making it site-specific. In this case, the knitting machines are up on the steps way in the background there, and it's very wild. I heard somebody just say, that's wild. It's very wild. Um, and it just is like flowing water. But of course, this one is in Los Angeles where water is a real problem. A lack of water is a problem. There's actually, um, you could probably Google, actually, I think if you go to Liz Collins' Knitting Nation website, uh, you can see a video, a uh, time-lapse video of this one being created. So Ruth Marshall um, worked for a while at the Bronx Zoo, and she was very concerned about um, extinction of animals. And she created these snakes, or these snake skins that she knit, but she displayed them as if they were um, in a museum of natural history because they are extinct and she's got the, the tags labeling them the way you would in a museum and they're pinned in place, trying to um, both you know, sort of remind you, she's not bringing them back, but she's reminding you of what we've lost. Um, she did an amazing series of ca cats, uh, wild cats, tigers, um, leopards that are extinct. This is nine feet by six feet, and it is all knit. And it is an accurate reproduction of a particular um, skin of a tiger that is was is on display in a museum. Um, she, it's a, an actual pelt from the American Museum of Natural History. I just thought the way she displayed this was so wonderful. <laughs> I mean, sort of grisly wonderful, but she's using the bamboo poles and the string, you know, to stretch it out, to have the pelt be stretched to dry. And then the whole idea of, it's a knitted rug. It didn't, you don't have to actually kill the animal to have the tiger on your floor. You could make a wool or knitted rug. Um, so, that, so in this way, her choice of material is just so totally appropriate for part of the message of, let's, of not killing the animals and making them extinct just for the luxury of having them on their floor. The point, uh, you're saying someone, I'm repeating in case people didn't hear, yes, the point of the hunter was to, was not to have a rug, it was to be a, a, a powerful hunter, yes, that's, that's probably what the hunter was thinking, yes. Um, here's another um, uh, piece that talks about the environment in a totally different way. Um, this is by Ben Cuevas, it's called Queering the Landscape. He made this portrait of the landscape um, purposely um, subverting, uh, his, his idea was to subvert the historically hetero male dominated practice of landscape painting. He himself is a Latinx gay artist and so he is interpreting the landscape from his point of view. Um, there's several things going on in this. First, he used a camera that he'd gotten from a gay elder to take photographs of the landscape around Joshua Tree, California, and then interpreted that photo in the um, knitted um, hanging. He purposely used a stitch that's called the faggoted fringe stitch. That's what it's called in Barbara Walker's Second Treasury of Knitting Patterns. And he combined it to some extent with weaving. Um, and it, it, he also points out that the result resembles macrame, which is a folk art frequently seen in the California desert and in Latinx cultures. So in all these different ways, he's bringing together lots of different messages and themes and creating something beautiful that 
gets people's attention. You see it in the gallery. You want to know why it's there. What's the story behind it? Has anybody here participated in the Tempestry project? OK. Um, this is a cool project that's currently ongoing that anybody could participate in. Um, it's a play on the words of temperature and tapestry. So um, this is two different um, um, bar, bar graph representations of the high temperatures in this location at two different points, probably 50 or 100 years apart. I think this one is in um, Sitka National Park in Alaska, if I remember correctly. And so the way this project works is you can um, choose any place you want, any location and any date that you want, and get the um, National Geographic um, NOAA. National Oceanographic Administration um, data for the high temperatures for one whole year, and you then use their color-coded uh, yarns that they will give you when you buy the kit, like figure out how much of each color to give you, and you then put one stripe for each day of the year. And people have done this um, for wherever they live. They've done it... Um, for a date that's special to them, and then they've done it for another date that is 50 or 100 years earlier or some other time period, so that you can visually see, you can visually see how much warmer it got by seeing the color change. It's just a really good way of translating things that sometimes are hard for us to understand. And um, the, that photo, the other photo, was part of a collection that Erica Zambello put together of pairs of the um, tempestries for a whole bunch of parks in the national park system. And there's now a book that, she's a professional photographer, and so there's a book that shows all those on display in each of the parks, and so it's beautiful. Uh, Erica Zambello, but the the Tempestry website is where you can actually order your own kit and you, you don't have to figure out how many inches of yarn you need for each temperature. They do it for you. <laughs> so, um, Another theme that has frequently been addressed by artists of all types and also by um, art knitters is um, war. And that, I already mentioned um, one piece. Adrian Sloan uh, made this flag, and it's called Faded Glory. Here, from a distance, you see it, and it's um, 55 inches tall. But if you get up close, you see that each of those is a little human figure, um, but a limp, a limp human figure. So this is a very powerful piece. This is another powerful piece, um, they all are, um, <laughs> um, by Barb Hunt, and it's called Anti-Personnel, and each of these knitted objects is a landmine. She made accurate representations of landmines, and here are some up close. And she put them purposely in a display case, and she purposely chose the pink, and the pink to some extent, could represent, you know, blood-stained clothing, or it could be pink of perhaps, a, it's sort of a soft feminine healing color, perhaps. I mean, you could interpret it in different ways, but by putting it in, I guess it's a little hard to tell, but that's in a glass case, you're also saying, oh, these are dangerous, we can't touch them. She's displayed this um, in places that um, it purposely places where veterans can see them and has um, had very moving experiences interacting with the people who've seen it. Here's one more example of Lisa Ann Auerbach's um, works. I showed you the mittens, but she also did this body count sweater, and she uses in it... Um, you can see uh, across the breast, it says shock and awe. Underneath that is the line of, of guns. At the bottom, 
I think those are either coffins or skulls. Um, so this is um, a, a piece that she's done, and it, she says, freedom frightens the enemy, and it's messy. She's actually also a photographer, and so some of the pieces that she has made, she has then staged in really cool settings um, for dramatic impact and taking photographs of them. She also did this really cool project. It's not literally knitted, but it is a billboard in, that was on display for a particular project on Interstate 77 in Cincinnati. Um, where, but, it's, but it looks knitted, it has that knitted motif. Um, she based these on sweaters that she had actually knit. Um, and each sweater uses a slogan from a historic presidential campaign. So this particular slogan, the stakes are too high for you to stay at home, was part of the famous Daisy ad by Lyndon Johnson in the 19, his 1964 campaign. And so doing this in 2016, She's taking something from history, she's putting it in this um, kind of sweet looking display and then you can then be pulled in to read the message. And I think in all of these works, what the artists, what I find so compelling about using knitting in these ways is that it's very approachable. You can pull people in before they quite realize what they're looking at and then you can have a, more of an opening perhaps to have a conversation. So some of those were things that you would just see on display. Some of those were pieces that you might participate in. Um, here are a couple of projects which involved actually sending the messages along the lines of the Sarah Corbett, um, the British craftivist idea, sending the message to a decision maker. So Kat Massa, who had done the Nike swoosh, she organized this project for crafters to knit helmet liners, and on each one you can see at the bottom, um, oh, I hadn't noticed that before, that that one, it, does that say Obama? But this was, it, it was in 2007 for the, for the Senate. Um, she, they knit them for every senator and put the senator's name on them and then sent them to the senators asking them to support the troops by bringing them home from Iraq and Afghanistan. She, so, and the idea of knitting helmet liners comes from World War I when one of the projects that the Red Cross organized and that people did was knitting helmet liners to keep the troops warm and they actually were sending them off. She um, collected the letters that she received in response to um, when, when she sent these to the senators, and she has some of them on her website, and she displayed some in exhibitions. I looked at some of them. Some of them say, oh, thank you for your kind thoughts, but I'm not allowed to accept gifts. I'm returning it to you. <laughs> um, but others said, thank you. That was so thoughtful. I'm doing what I can to support the troops in this way or that way. Um, it, you know, they may, the letters may have been written by a staffer, but part of the idea is that maybe they'll remember that they got something tangible. Um, along that same line, and uh, a different theme, was this project which was organized by a group of people, including Donna Dracunas, called in 2012, called the Government Free VJJ project um, to knit little uteruses <laughs> and send them, to knit pink uteruses and send them to every member of Congress. Um, it actually, I, th I think they sent them mostly to male legislators in Congress and the 50 states. <laughs> and th because they sent them with a message that said, hands off my uterus, here's one of your own. <laughs> so. Um, and the, they, this was particularly prompted by Rush Limbaugh's insulting comments about a Georgia law student who had testified before a congressional committee um, about insurance coverage for contraception. And um, they, they said, you know, we're hoping this gets the attention of the lawmakers who we send it to. So speaking of pink, of course, there are the pink pussy hats, which <laughs> um, 
I think everybody has, is familiar with. And I think now you can kind of see, like, these did not come out of nowhere. They are connected to all of these different um, uh, uh, themes that, and, and practices that were already happening. And I remember reading, right after they came out, a New Yorker um, little short um, commentary that apparently um, President Trump said something about, oh, where'd they get those? You know, they weren't made in the USA, were they? Well, of course, <laughs> of course they were, because once again, this is this anti-capitalist message of making them by hand, the power of the ordinary individual making them and expressing individuality. They're not all exactly the same, and they are a, a feminist symbol. And this is very much in contrast to the red MAGA hats that were all the same, and they were made in Bangladesh and China and Vietnam. So there's actually so many other layers of what's going on here. So those hats inspired other hats, and just a few months later, the March for Science, um, this uh, PhD, biology PhD, um, Heidi Aries, um, created and published patterns for hats, and then she also had this shawl that she made that says, don't unravel science. But she published patterns for hats that were all blue and green, the colors of the earth, for encouraging people to make them and wear them at the science march. And so you can see some say science, some have computers, some have um, the third one down on the left, those are um, lab, lab equipment, beakers and things, you see wind, turbines, um, various sciencey things. So, oh, actually it says underneath each one what they are. <laughs> so. There's another project that is very recent that just happened called the Violet Protest. This was organized by Ann Morton and um, each of these squares is eight inches by eight inches and those are stacked very high I'll show you another picture in a moment. Um, she wanted to comment, so this is, was done in 2020 and 2021. She wanted every square to be equal parts red and blue because she wanted to try to bring people together and have people interact with respect. And a couple of thousand crafters knit, crocheted, quilted, wove, embroidered these different squares. And so here you can get another sense of how many they are, how big they are. And she collected them all. They were on display at the Albuquerque Museum of Art. And then um, she then sent stacks, stacks of them to every member of the most current Congress and with them had a list of who made every single one and had a letter in, that everybody essentially had signed on to by participating that called on the Congress people to work together in the spirit of cooperation. Some, they're all different, any method that the person wanted to do as long as they used equal parts red and blue in them. So then I wanted to just tell you a little bit about um, my democracy work. So I've made some, um, I make mixed media knitted sculptures and these are nine inch by, uh, nine inch by 12 inch, uh, five inches deep. Um, I did this series called Making the Voters Chicken. Um, and this one is called Follow the Instructions. Um, referring to all of the instructions that are different in every state on how to vote by mail, what forms you have to fill out, where do you have to sign, whether it has to be notarized. Um, and another one called line time. These little chickens are lining up to vote, um, but they're running out of time because it's 10 minutes to four and the polls are closing at four and the line is really long. So I, I try to use humor and animals, you know, so that you're not talking about any particular people, but getting people to 
be pulled in and then think about, well, what's really going on here and what's going on in our world around us. I have been influenced a lot by a lot of the artists that I've talked about here. Um, and so in late 2019, I decided that I was going to do a collaborative art project of some kind. And so another piece of my background is that for um, more than 25 years, I was a lawyer for the Vermont Attorney General's Office. And I specialized in election law. And I left that position in 2018. And so I was making, I'd been making artwork for a very long time. And I was um, thinking about a collaborative art project. And then it was sort of like, oh, of course, my collaborative art project has, should have something to do with elections. And I started the project and started to get people interested. And um, it really took off in 2020 for some reason. <laughs> so. What I did was, so I really wanted to help people learn more about how elections work. How does the electoral process work? And I have evolved what I talk about in my presentations over time as the type of misinformation has moved over time. And I, at first, because of the pandemic, had to hold knitting circles on Zoom and then eventually was able to hold them in person. But as I would hold these knitting circles, be like an hour and a half, and people would make a um, four inch by six inch rectangle of a piece that was going to be assembled into a knitted sculpture of a state capital. So these are pieces that people made in those circles and sent to me. And then I assembled them into this sculpture that is um, five feet long, three and a half feet tall, about three feet deep. And it's meant to be a generic um, state capital. Um, and it represents the ideas of all these different individuals with their individuality showing up in the slightly different colors of pieces and the different textures of pieces. And that, but together they can make this coherent whole that is more powerful than the individual pieces themselves. The knitted hands are all different colors and come from different parts of the community. And they're holding knitting needles, continuing to work on it because democracy isn't complete. We need people to continue working. And the process of making laws is an ongoing process. I then um, asked, I was continuing to hold more knitting circles after the physical <laughs> sculpture was done. Um, and I was so happy to be able to hold them in person, finally, because in these knitting circles, people who didn't know each other but had something in common because they knit or crocheted, or in one case, with a dad who came with his daughter, I said, look, you can um, use this spool knitter and you can make a cord. You're not gonna just sit there. He was game. <laughs> I just involved people, even if they didn't know how to knit. And they made um, lawn and garden squares. And then I was able to hold an event at the Vermont State House where the sculpture is currently on display. And people came and helped stitch together the pieces that had been made at the knitting circles. So the question is, have I thought about having that piece tra travel to every state house in the union? So what I would really like to do is to hold more Knit Democracy Together events in other states and create them in those communities. And I actually... We could talk after and see what we can arrange. <laughs> That's a... It's a wonderful, wonderful idea of having it, I'll just repeat it, because I'm not sure the Zoom people heard, um, that I think Deirdre yesterday had suggested I have the piece travel for one week to every state house in the country and then have it go to the US Capitol for display. That'd be great. Uh, yes, we'll work on that. I mean, definitely. I, I mean, I, I, I am, well, so, and actually, we have made more than one. Um, so, because I was holding them on Zoom, the upside of that was I was able to hold a knitting circle with the Windy City Knitting Guild in Chicago, and they worked with um, a 
people at a yarn shop there spearheaded creating an Illinois state capital that they then um, created there and displayed. And I worked with the Rochester Public Library in New York State, and they created the New York State Capitol. So we have made three so far. And I really want to hold these events um, in a way that continues the education of people and gets people um, I would, my ideal is to help move people from being civically minded and, and curious and about the craft and then learn something, maybe learn something about gerrymandering, learn something about voting by mail, and then they have that information to correct misinformation if they hear it, or they have met someone in the group who has done some voter protection work and they say, oh, you know, maybe I'm possibly going to do that because I just met Susie and she does that. That's what I'm trying to do with these. And it's an evolving process. Um, but for instance, at this event where we were stitching together the pieces, um, we were having also discussion about what have you been doing um, this election season to help protect voters. And we engaged in conversation. This is um, Mark Newport wearing his sweater man suit. Uh, he teaches textile arts at Cranbrook Academy, and he's made this series of Superman uh, takeoff themed cre cre creature people, uh, superheroes, superheroes. <laughs> so I'm hoping that this sweater man will inspire you to do something really positive and, um, and impactful with your knitting, crafting, crocheting, whatever. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much um, on behalf of the museum. I'm sure this audience is very thankful too for sharing such amazing, beautiful work um, and really impactful work and also sharing about your practice. I think um, I, I love seeing artwork and I love hearing artists talk about their process and how they aim to impact the world. And so thank you so much. I hope all of you enjoyed today's program. Um, it was sort of a uh, a, a project that was came from my own heart as a knitter myself. Um, so I'm really glad to see all of you uh, come out here today. Some people brought projects. It's really wonderful. And thank you all again for coming tonight. Have a good one. Bye-bye. <laughs>